I first heard Margot Adler's voice on the radio, along with Lachmi Singh, Lourdes Garcia Navarro, <laughs> Sylvia Pajoli, <laughs> Athabia Quis Arston, uh, Arcton, Kai Rizdahl, and so many others. I learned their names through repetition as they signed off at the end of news stories on Morning Edition or All Things Considered. Margot Adler, NPR News, New York. There were many opportunities to hear Margot Adler, who was an NPR reporter for more than three decades prior to her death from cancer in 2014, at a far too young an age, 68. When I first began learning more about our UU6 source, it's printed on the back of your order of service, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. When I first started learning about our Six Source two books, both published on the same day, Halloween 1979, were recommended to me as starting points. One, the author of our story this morning that Danielle shared, uh, Starhawk, the spiral dance, a rebirth of the ancient religion of the goddess. And the second was drawing down the moon. Witches, druids, goddess worshippers, and other pagans in America by Margot Adler. It took me a while to make the connection, but then I realized, wait a second, Margot Adler on NPR is the same Margot Adler who wrote one of the definitive guides to the modern pagan movement in the U.S. As Irene shared earlier, Ad Adler was also a Unitarian Universalist. She was a member of the Unitarian Church of All Souls in New York City, as well as an active board member for many years of the National Board of the Covenant of UU Pagans, of which our group here is an affiliate. Margot Adler's father was a therapist. He was also the son, the only son, of the famous psychotherapist Alfred Adler founder of the school of thought known as individual psychology and a close collaborator of Sigmund Freud and of Carl Jung before the schisms that broke those three apart. Today, Alfred Adler is remembered for those terms like inferiority complex. He gave us the term lifestyle, compensate, overcompensate. He discovered the importance of birth order and emphasized that it's actually really not about sex. Usually if there's a problem, it's about power. So he emphasized it's really about incorrect power relations if there's a problem with sexuality. Margot was that famous Dr. Adler's only grandchild. And in her autobiography, Heretic's Heart, she writes regarding that heritage that I was both proud of it and wary. And choosing not to father, follow in her father and grandmother's footsteps, she finished college without taking a single psychology course. <laughs> Growing up in a secular Jewish home, when she asked, you know, what is our family's religion? She, they, she was told, we believe in the brotherhood of man. And in the classic case of the grass looks greener on the other side, from her childhood perspective, being told that the, she, she thought that that brotherhood of man language seemed pretty sterile despite its high ethics, and she actually grew up believing that her Roman Catholic friends had the better deal. <laughs> so they probably thought the same thing. Interestingly, for high school, Margot attended the same performing arts high school that inspired the 1980 film Fame. And in seeking to incorporate an artistic, feminist, ecological perspective into what she called her semi-Marxist brotherhood of man childhood, she writes that in our either-or obsessive world, it seems that people feel they have to go from one totalistic belief to the other. Skepticism and mystery seem to be sworn enemies. You're either a socialist or you're a capitalist. You're either a skeptic or a believer. It's all or nothing. You either think LSD will save the world or you think everyone who takes it will lose their mind. She writes that the world of the old left that I grew up in had great truths, but it could not bridge these divisions. It was too afraid of the irrational and of its pull, and it did not really understand the human need 
for the voice and mystery of ecstatic experience. It did not realize that one can enter the flow of the mysterious, the non-ordinary reality known to artists, poets, and indigenous peoples without losing one's intellectual integrity, that one can dance around a bonfire till dawn and still make one's living as a computer scientist or a programmer, as a scientist or a computer programmer, that one can work to end poverty and exploitation but still embrace song and dance and dream. Like the shamans of old, we can attempt to maintain our balance as we move between different worlds. Our Big Tent perspective of Unitarian Universalism, which draws from six diverse sources of which Earth-centered religions is one, seeks to hold a space for the fullness and the tension of such polarities in which they can be honored and recognized. And Margot's interest in exploring the mysterious, the ecstatic, and the non-ordinary while maintaining her day job at NPR led to, her, to the extensive travels and interviews that were compiled into her 646-page brick of a book, Drawing Down the Moon, which is Druids, Goddess Worshippers, and Other Pagans in America. I mentioned earlier that this book was originally published on Halloween in 1979. A completely revised and updated third edition was published in 2006. And to reflect on some of the changes in the religious landscape in, in those three and a half decades and today, you know, between the situation and context that led her to feel like she needed to write those, those books, some of the situations that Irene described, the best estimates that are in the early 1980s, modern pagans, heathens, druids, and Wiccans in the U.S. numbered less than 100,000 people. Today, estimates are four to seven times that number, with more than a million worldwide. Keep in mind, there's about 800,000 UUs in the world. The rapid growth of that movement within UU circles in particular led to the addition of our sixth source of Earth-centered religions in 1995. 20 years ago. And we saw the interest in our own area recently in Earth-centered spirituality when more than 336 people showed up for our first annual Pagan Pride Day here at UUCF in September, more than three times the number that we anticipated. From a much broader historical perspective, one of the most important points to remember is that all those negative connotations that some of us grew up having with words like pagan and heathen that historically speaking, those negative pejorative connotations are of quite recent origin. I spoke about this in early September to review that very briefly. Even for centuries after the life of the historical Jesus, that Latin word paganus simply meant peasant. Likewise, the word heathen simply meant people who live in the heath, someone who lives in the country, not in the city. And as Christianity, which was primarily an urban phenomenon in the Roman Empire, rose in provenance, those pagans and those heathens who remained in the country and retained their pre-Christian, ancestral, polytheistic, nature-based religion came to be seen as idolaters, infidels, and heretics for their refusal to accept Christianity. But those terms were not how they saw themselves. They were the terms that were applied to them. A related confusion is the conflation of neo-paganism with Satanism. That view is yet another result of seeing the world primarily through a theologically conservative lens. Neo-pagans seek to retrieve pre-Christian traditions, reinterpreting the mythology, the gods and goddesses, those archetypes of the divine feminine and the divine masculine. They seek to retrieve them from Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians and the Sumerians. In contrast, Satanism is grounded precisely within the Jewish and Christian traditions in which Satan is seen as this, is revered as this symbolic figure of rebellion against the Christian gods. Whereas paganism is saying, y'all do whatever you want, but we're over here and stop trying to define us on your playing field. As a result of such confusions, when Adler was first doing her interviews after the release of Drawing Down the Moon, so this only grandchild of Alfred Adler, this NPR correspondent, wrote this book, she got a lot of media interviews. She found herself frequently facing questions, even from mainstream media sources, based on ignorant stereotypes. She was often asked, so, 
why do you have black hair? And she would say, I was born that way. She would say, is that scar on your leg from, you know, a wound from a ritual? She would say, no, I cut my leg shaving. <laughs> so looking back at that time period, she says that in the media, it seemed that it was only possible to write about five different media stories about paganism. The perverted individual who was killing animals and calling themselves a witch. A custody battle between a couple, usually one of them a witch and one of them a Christian. A Wiccan gathering that was being picketed by Christian fundamentalists. A bill that would take away tax-exempt status from Wiccans, religious groups. And a trial for somebody on murder who was allegedly a witch. Far getting back to the Salem witch trial days, right? The more things change, the more they sometimes stay the same. But in the ensuing three decades, books such as Margot's have helped increase awareness of how most neo-pagans actually speak and perceive themselves. They sense an aliveness and a presence in nature. They share the goal of living in harmony with nature, and they tend to view humanity's advancement, which is often seen as unalloyed progress, as a separation from nature and one of our prime sources of alienation. They see ritual as a tool to end that alienation. They gravitate toward ancient symbols and ancient myths, to the old polytheistic religions. They are reclaiming these sources for the 21st century and transforming them. They do not regard pleasure as sinful, nor do they conceive of this world as a burden. While many of their members lead quite ordinary, often successful lives in the real world, they are able to detach themselves from many of the trends of the day. And this is my favorite description of, from Margot of of paganism. She said they, they often maintain a gentle sense of humor, a gentle anarchism, and a remarkable tolerance for diversity. This religious movement is only partially what you could call an occult phenomenon, occult meaning dealing with that which is hidden or beyond the range of ordinary apprehension and understanding. Often it is interwoven with the visionary and artistic tradition, the ecology movement, the feminist movement, and the libertarian tradition. If you're curious to experience some of this movement for yourself, our UU Pagan group has three regular gatherings in which all are welcome. Every third Sunday at the 10.30 a.m. middle hour, there is an Earth-Centered Spirituality service in the chapel. On each full moon, they host an evening labyrinth walk, which during the warm parts of the year are outside. The labyrinth in between our sanctuary and chapel will move inside on an indoor labyrinth for the cooler months. And there is a ritual and potluck meal to celebrate each of the eight points on what is known as the Wheel of the Year. So the four, uh, the two solstices, the two equinoxes, and then the cross-border days exactly between them. The next turning point on the Wheel of the Year is Samhain also known as Halloween or All Hallows Eve, so in between the fall equinox and the winter solstice. And appropriate for this current turning point on the wheel of the year, there is a final part of the legacy of Margot Adler that I would like to share with you. In May of 2009, Adler was on the way to a conference and just looking for a light airplane read. She ended up buying the first novel in the Twilight series, you haven't heard so much about it. She read that book on the way there and the sequel on the flight home. She says she had never previously been particularly interested in vampires and that that didn't necessarily inspire her to read another vampire book, except that 10 days later, her husband of 35 years was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Similar to the reason why Anne Rice began her huge Vampire Chronicle series, because she was dealing with the death of her young daughter. Uh, as Adler's beloved husband lay dying of cancer, she found herself unexpectedly drawn to reading more about vampires because she was thinking a lot about mortality. She kept a list and in total read more than 270 vampire novels over during that time. She eventually published her reflection in her third and final book, Vampires Are Us, Understanding Our Love Affair with the Immortal Dark Side, in which she reflects on why she and our wider culture more broadly have been drawn at various, various points, in particular to that vampire archetype. One of the keys to Adler's understanding of the vampire archetype was an insight from a scholar that 
every age embraces the vampire it needs. For example, Bram Stoker's Dracula was published in 1897 in England, a time when that country had some of the largest ports in the world. And Stroker's novel reflects the fears at that time about immigration through the lens of Dracula, an Eastern European monster, dark, mysterious, and alien. Similarly, in the 1980s, just as the AIDS epidemic was spreading, there was a slew of vampire novels that saw vampirism as an infection, as a disease that spread rapidly and catastrophically. Today, in such series as Buffy the Vampire Slayer, The Twilight Saga, True Blood, The Vampire Diaries, and actually many, many more, we see a much less of an emphasis on monstrous, remorseless vampires, or vampirism is this catastrophic disease, and much more of an emphasis on good guy vampires who are guilt-ridden and conflicted about their nature. So why are these stories so popular at precisely this time in our cultural moment? Adler writes that as she sees it, vampires are exactly us right now. As we continue to wage wars, consume energy, and find ourselves sucking the lifeblood out of this planet, we, like vampires, live compromised lives. You could argue that we are as addicted to oil and fossil fuels as any vampire is addicted to blood. Vampires are us, and the issue is how we can learn to use our formidable powers as a species without first destroying the planet for future generations. And like vampires, the answer of how that will turn out is unclear. Parallel to the ways that those ancient pagan gods and goddesses can serve as archetypes to help us become more aware of previously unconscious parts of ourselves, so too there is an invitation to become more conscious of the metaphorical and archetypal motivations underneath why various aspects of our world are particularly attractive or repulsive to us individually or collectively at any given time. There's a lot to be, more to be said about that dynamic, about the ways that cultural stories reflect deep truths about the human condition. For example, you may or may not realize, like, oh, werewolf stories are really about wrestling with puberty, right? <laughs> For example, I've preached about this before in a sermon called Hunger Games, the Zombie Apocalypse, and the Meaning of Myths, Old and New. I'll link to that if you want to see more. But for now, we've been reflecting this morning in particular on the legacy of Margot Adler, one of our UU ancestors. And in this season of Samhain, as All Hallows' Eve approaches, I invite you to spend some more time reflecting further on your ancestors, both your intellectual and spiritual ancestors who inspire you on your journey through this life, as well as your biological ancestors who gave you life. As you listen to the song to follow, I invite you to open your mind and your heart to your ancestors. Is there one beloved ancestor in particular whose name, whose face may rise in your heart today and in your mind, whose memory you may want to honor? As we listen together, I invite you to open your heart and mind to the legacy of those who came before us and how they might continue inspire our living.